so great to be together here this morning. I'd like to ask you, if you will, join me and we'll pray. Our Father in heaven, we've come to fill this place, thousands of hungry souls, and we brought our stories with us today. We brought our hopes and our fears. We brought our anxieties and our depressions our regrets and our tears, and we've come to you because you are our hope. We've come to you because we're looking to you for hope. We've come to you because we're waiting for a breakthrough. We've come to you because you're the Lord of life. You're the lover of our souls. You're the healer of our wounds. You're the forgiver of our deepest needs. And so, Lord, come now. Meet with us. Move in us. Heal our souls and lift them to hope. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Amen. Amen. I've been a part of several funerals lately. And for a young church like ours, it's a little bit unusual that we would have several funerals in a row. All three of these funerals have happened in the last couple of months. And all three of them have been what you would call premature deaths. Each one of those deaths bringing the barren landscapes of loneliness and the ghost towns of grief as our souls are reaching out in the separations that death has brought. We come to this place this morning and we come because Jesus has something to say about this. And there's an account in the scriptures where Jesus is facing the experience of the death of a very close friend of his. His friend's name is Lazarus. This is how the Bible tells it. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. They said, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. He went on to tell his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus seems to apparently have a remarkably different view of death than Martha seems to have. She seems quite alarmed about it, quite exercised about it. How mysterious that, in fact, when she told him that her brother was near death, it says, so Jesus stayed where he was for two days. What? Who does that? No, Jesus, apparently you didn't hear me. I said he's near death. You don't stay for two days when I'm telling you that we have a crisis on our hands. Somehow early in the story, Jesus facing the death of a very close friend of his begins to portray to us that he seems to have a de very different perspective of death than we do. You know that love hates death. You know that love means that we wish to be with those we love forever. And death brings a separation that grieves our souls, and love hates death. And love hates the separations that death brings. But once we begin to understand who Jesus Christ is, these separations are never goodbye forever. They are only goodbye for now, and we will be together again, because love will do something about this separation that death brings to us, and Jesus intends to address it. He seems rather unconcerned about death. He seems to not fear its finality. 
Stunningly, he refers to it by saying, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And his disciples must have whispered to each other, I don't think he gets it. No, Jesus said he's fallen asleep and I'm going there to wake him up. You get the glimpse of how Jesus sees death? He sees it as sleep, a temporary moment from which we know that we will rise. This from the mouth of the Son of God who came from heaven into the world. He sees it the way we see sleep. If you were to take a nap, you would lay down peacefully, knowing that you would rest with full and 100% confidence that soon you'll wake from that sleep and you'll feel well and you'll be rested. And Jesus is likening death to sleep. He's removing the tentacles of fear. He's removing the fear of forever separations. Interestingly, we get a picture of how Martha and Jesus now have quite a different theology. She speaks of the resurrection as a religious reach, an abstract idea. To this, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. She is looking at this as a religious reach and an abstraction, and he is looking at this as a personal power and a personal relationship. And in saying this, he's offering this to her. He's saying, I am here, I am the resurrection and the life. And shortly after he said it, he then goes to the tomb where Lazarus is. And he says, Lazarus, come out, and he raises him. Fine and well, and then only shortly thereafter that, Jesus Christ went to his own tomb. And the scriptures tell us on the third day, God raised him. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he asks her the question, do you believe this? He's not asking her this to test her or to make her feel uncomfortable. He's asking her because he loves her and love wishes to be together. And Jesus' hope for her soul is that she will be with him and in him in the fullness of life forever. He is turning this idea of religious abstractions to a personal understanding. And now we begin to see ever more clearly that Christianity is Jesus, and Jesus is Christianity. It is not rote rituals any longer or hollow habits, but a personal connection with him who is the resurrection and the life. So is this resurrection intellectually viable? You may be here today and have skeptical views of this. I appreciate that. There was a day when I would have laughed at the idea that people would believe this. I would have thought, oh my goodness, those poor Christians, they believe this pipe dream. But there is a reality for us to consider and to enter. There either is a God or there isn't. And if there isn't, there is nothing after. And if there is, it's only one small step to an understanding that he's the giver of life. And if he is the giver of life, it is no problem to realize that he can give it again. And so Jesus Christ is the one who says, I'm the resurrection and the life. James Martin, a Catholic theologian, says, the resurrection strikes us quite differently than Christmas. Christmas is a birth. It's kind of cute. Jesus is sort of cuddly and cozy. By the way, we can all relate to a birth because we've all been through one. All of us have some baby pictures somewhere around that our mom showed us. Unless you're like the third or fourth in the birth order, then your mom didn't take any pictures anymore. <laughs> but we were all raised, I mean, we were all born, but only Jesus has been raised. Where birth is cute, the resurrection is a revolution. And Jesus is the one in the world who says, I'm the resurrection and the life. In John 11:44, he raises Lazarus, and then it says, he went to the tomb, the dead man came out, and what Jesus says is, regarding Lazarus, take the grave clothes off, and let him come out, let him be free, take the grave clothes off, and let him go. Jesus is saying, deal with the deadness, and set him free. And you realize, for every one of us here today, the first work of Jesus in our lives is always to deal with our deadness. He's always inviting us to bring our deadness to him. Our deadness often comes to him through honest statements, through vulnerabilities, and through things that may be hard for us to say. But when Jesus says, take the grave clothes off and let him go, 
we realize that the first effort and the first work that God is always wanting to do in our lives is take off the grave clothes of deadness. But we also realize that it is usually our souls that die long before our bodies do. Our souls die through the experiences of the years. And you know, one thing that every one of us has in common, regardless of where you may be in any religious interest, one thing all of us have in common is our souls are hungry. Our souls are so hungry. And we're looking and hoping that our souls would have this hunger filled and that we might find answers for our souls. John Mayer wrote a song called Something's Missing years ago. He said, I'm dizzy from the shopping malls. I've searched for joy and I bought it all. It doesn't help the hunger pains and a thirst I'd have to drown first to ever satiate. Something's missing and I don't know how to fix it. Something's missing and I don't know what it is at all. Friends, check. Money, check. A well-slept, check. Opposite sex, check. When he gets on to his further considerations, he says again, something's missing and I don't know how to fix it. Something's missing and I don't know what it is at all. You see, almost all of us, as the years begin to accumulate, begin to have voices in our heads. And you're thinking, wait, I don't want anyone to know I have voices in my head. We've all got them. And as the years accumulate, the voices are usually some version of, you are not enough. And these words and these voices of how you are not enough become cemeteries for our souls, deadening the hope and the life that God offers us. We begin to have these voices of condemnation and failure. So this past week, in a gathering of a number of people, I asked them, would you be kind enough to be vulnerable and anonymously write on some index cards, what are the not enough voices in your life? What do you hear the voices saying, you are not enough? And I think almost all of us have these voices. I'm gonna share 13 of these cards of what people said, and I bet you might be able to find yourself here. Not honest, trusting, smart, caring, or focused enough. Not strong enough. Not happy enough, not forgiven enough, not free enough. Not driven enough, not spiritual enough. Not outgoing or confident enough. Not pure enough not thin enough, not attractive enough, not accomplished enough, not rich enough, not talented enough, not charismatic enough, not brave enough, not real enough, not vulnerable enough, not honest enough. And the last one said, not enough enough. Nothing about me is enough. I bet you find yourself in those places of those voices in your mind. These places become cemeteries for our souls. And so in the midst of this, Martha, who's also got these voices, says essentially to Jesus, where were you and why didn't you do something about this? But love hates the separations of death and Jesus intends to do something about it. And so he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Now all of this religion out there is personal. Now all of Christianity is Jesus, and Jesus is all of Christianity. And in that moment, he asks her, do you believe this? He uses a very interesting word because he says something quite much more like this. Do you believe into this, is what he asks her. And now all of a sudden, we realize that this question of belief is not an irrelevant mental ascent on the bookshelf of our life to which we never go for the living of our days. But the living is an actual entrance. The believing is something we enter, and when we enter it, it enters us. And now life becomes new, and the healing begins. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and look at this, he will not be judged, but has crossed over. So this life is not just some distant hope of heaven. It's a crossing over now as our souls come out of their cemeteries and into the healing that he offers us. 
And saying yes to Jesus' kind question is where the healing actually begins. So Jesus is saying to Lazarus and to us, take off the grave clothes and be free. Take off the grave clothes of those voices that keep you going back to the shovels and digging those holes in the cemeteries for our souls again. Bring your whole self, vulnerable, bring your true story. Bring the parts that nobody sees. Vulnerability, check. Rawness, check. Tears, check. Shame, check. Jesus meets us in all of these places. And if you're in the barrenness of soul cemeteries today, or you are experiencing the graveyards of grief, Jesus Christ is inviting you today to take off the grave clothes and come out and be free. Happy Easter, everybody. Will you please stand? Let's worship together.
So this gift isn't just for today, it's now for the living of all of our days. The Apostle Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, being kept in heaven for us. Happy Easter, everybody. Amen.